Part 1 Ritual Magic Chapter 1 The Complete Ritual of Ceremonial Magic The Key of Solomon, Son of David This is probably the most celebrated and at the same time most feared work in the whole of ceremonial magic. Controversies have raged for centuries as to its authenticity and as to whether there ever was a Hebrew version, and it is only relatively recently that fresh light has been thrown on the question. Again and again, in the works of clerical writers against witchcraft, the Key of Solomon is called the Book of the Devil. It was one of the books which Geronimo de Labana confessed to having seen in the home of the Count of Zabellan. These, he said, had been bought in Antwerp and smuggled into Spain, and their cost was well over 4,000 escudos. Also in that small collection was a copy of the Almadel, which is included in the present work. The Inquisition of 1559 also prohibited the key as a dangerous book, and the Roman Inquisition proscribed the Book of Solomon for the same reason. Circumstantial evidence now shows that the Key of Solomon has existed, in one form or another, from very remote antiquity. Certain of its words of power, the actual arrangement of the processes, point to Semitic and even Babylonian origins. The opinion of the present writer is that it may have entered Europe through the medium of the Gnostics, Kabbalists, and similar magica religious schools. We cannot be sure, of course, as to how much of the work as we know it is original, and how much must be attributed to later editions. This, from one point of view, is not really important. If we are to decide about originality, we are faced with two important and altogether mysterious considerations. Need it have had one single author, and need he have been the actual historical Solomon, son of David? Secondly, we are drawn into the morass of wondering whether the rituals are true, that is, do they work? This type of study, however, is outside the scope of the present work. Contentions levelled against the key have, so far, been confined to criticism as unfounded as anything in magic itself may be. One writer says that it could not have been the work of King Solomon because he was a good man. It may be mentioned that an occultist could reply to this with some justification that the Bible says that Solomon fell and gave way to temptation. The oldest known version in this form is the 16th century Latin copy in the British Museum. Again, orthodox religionists have fought against the content, if not the authenticity, of the key because of its alleged diabolical character. Western occultists have counterattacked with the thesis that anything diabolical is a later edition and does not belong to the true work, which is, they say, nothing more nor less than the purest spirit of high magic working through the divine force. We know the key in Europe through the manuscript copies which are buried in the great libraries of London, Paris and other centres. With the exception of one partial version several hundred years old, which is not obtainable, there has been no unbiased version ever seen in print at any time. The manuscripts, diagrams and their arrangements and sequence differ from copy to copy. French and Latin are the usual languages in which the key is found, and most copies date from the 18th century. But we must go much further back for evidence that the key, or something very much like it, has existed for probably over 2,000 years. Even in the first century AD, as Flavius Josephus tells us, there was such a book. Eleazar the Jew exorcised devils with its help, and with the Ring of Solomon, which is so well known to students of the Arabian Nights. The Great Albert, the same spellbook which is reproduced in full in these pages, quotes from one Aaron, who is certainly Aaron Isaac, 
the magician and interpreter of Emperor Manuel Comnenus. The book that Isaac used is, from all internal evidence, the clavicle, Key of Solomon, and shows that its currency had continued from the 1st to the 11th century. The actual Albert, of course, was not yet on the scene, and these grimoires did not become widely current in the West until the 13th century. One copy tells how the key was to be buried with Solomon in his tomb, and how it was taken to Babylon and then brought back by a prince of that country. All created things must obey its secrets. To return to the Arabian Nights evidence, it is thought that a good deal of the material content of the Nights is based upon stories of Babylonian origin. The Arabs themselves possessed no book describing Solomon's life and magical activities as mentioned in the Nights, at least no book that has been mentioned by the very voluminous and indefatigable bibliographers of ancient Arabia. These facts have led to a supposition that the key may be derived from a body of magic initiated or used by Solomon, which was then, or later, current among the sorcerers of the eastern Mediterranean. This contention is interesting in that there have been suggestions that Solomon's work is connected with the body of magical ritual used in ancient Egypt and attributed to Hermes. The term hermetic is still used to denote alchemical and secret works. There has been a confusion in comments and history due to the fact that several books have circulated under the general title of Solomon's Key. The Key of Rabbi Solomon, for example, is a totally different work, dealing with planetary talismans. It may, however, be connected with the Solomonic clavicle. Again, there is another and very rare key attributed to Solomon, which is not generally available for comparison, and which is considered important enough to have a special section devoted to it in this present book. This very interesting contribution tells how Solomon first came into contact with the genie whom he was later to control, how he compelled their obedience, and of his downfall. The Lamegaton, or Little Key of Solomon, is another book examined in these pages, which deals with evocation of spirits. It is distinct, however, from the grimoire which follows. It is extraordinary how, in the study of occultism, people seem to put the cart before the horse. Eliphas Levy, the Frenchman of the 19th century, whose real name was Constant, was very greatly influenced by the last of the English magicians, Francis Barrett, author of the much-quoted but almost never seen Magus, the Celestial Intelligencer, published in 1801. Barrett quoted original sources in his tome and was the first man to reduce the available works of the sorcerers into a system of magic, at any rate, the first of the self-professed occultists to do so. But while Levy's Dogma et Rituel and other books have been translated into English and carefully annotated by the translator, Barrett remains a literally closed book. You cannot buy a copy of the Magus without months of searching, and then only at a very high price indeed. Few examples have even changed hands during the past quarter of a century. Levy again based his system of magic largely upon the Key of Solomon, which we are now discussing. The actual key is not, or has not so far, been generally available for comparison. That such comparison is sorely needed is evidenced by the fact that it is universally acknowledged that Levy himself was anything but accurate in his exposition of magic. Innumerable footnotes by the actual translator of Levy's History of Magic point this out, quite apart from the obvious mistakes throughout the book. Of these two important sources, then, the key is now presented. 
Perhaps someday the magus will be made available also. Warning to the possessor of this book. This section is not contained in all versions of the grimoire. It exists in the manuscript copies translated into French, quote, from the Hebrew, by Abraham Colorno, of which a few copies are known in the British Museum and the Paris Arsenal Library. The person into whose hands the manuscript may fall is cautioned and adjured not to part with its secrets to anyone who may be unworthy because of the power said to reside in its pages. This is the general rule in relation to the secret doctrines of magical and alchemical works. The text is as follows. This work of Solomon is composed of two books. In the first you can see how to avoid mistakes in operations with the spirits. In the second book you are taught how to perform the arts of magic. You must take the greatest care that this key of secrets does not get into the hands of the foolish and the ignorant. He who has it, and uses it according to the instructions, will be able not only to perform magical ceremonies, he will be able, in the case of errors, to correct them. No operation will succeed unless the exorcist understands completely what he is about. I therefore most earnestly adjure the person who gains possession of this key of secrets not to pass it on, nor to share its knowledge to anyone, unless he is faithful and can keep a secret, and is proficient in the magical art. I humbly pray the possessor of this, by the name of God Tetragrammaton, yod he vau and by the name Adonai, and by all the other names of God, the High and Holy, that he should treat this work as precious as his own soul, and share it with no foolish or ignorant person. The Destruction of Enemies this is a rite from the Key of Solomon, which concentrates upon creating discord between and harm against two lovers. The assumption is that the operator has some vital interest in this separation. At the same time, of course, magicians were wont to take a spell such as this and modify it according to the result desired. Spells, that is to say, are not inflexible. This is almost a principle of magic. Magical literature abounds with processes directed towards certain results, which are clearly derived from a quite different inspiration. This fact goes far towards indicating that it is the intensity of the magical force, rather than its actual character, which determines its efficacy, according to magical belief. This is what Solomon has to say about operations of destruction. It is important always to observe the requirements of the days and hours in which the operation is to be carried out, irrespective of the method used, and the correct instruments, perfumes and so on are to be used, i.e. works of hatred are done in the day and hour of Saturn, and offensive incense, asaphodita, etc., are used. In the case of an image being used, write the name of the person upon it with a consecrated needle and say over the image, Uso, dilapidatore, tentatore, soignatore, devoratore, conquitore, et seductore. Then this spell is pronounced, still over the waxen image. O commanders and friends, I conjure and command you to obey this order without hesitation. Consecrate this figure in the name, name of the person to be cursed, and the one is against the other, thus they are henceforth irreconcilable, i.e. the lovers whom it is desired to part. Then the image is to be placed in contact with the noxious fumes which are burning in a dish, the fumigations of Mars, brimstone and asafoetida, 
The effigy is left in this atmosphere for a complete night. A variation of this curse is when food is bewitched to cause discomfort and disaster. Food and drink are unusually potent conductors of curses, as is quoted in Westermark's Origin and Development of Moral Ideas. The efficacy of a wish or curse depends not only upon the potency which it possesses from the beginning, but also in the vehicle by which it is contained, just as the strength of an electric shock depends both on the original strength of the current and on the condition of the conductor. As particularly efficient conductors are regarded blood, bodily contact, food, and drink. For the curse, the actual food is addressed in the days and hours of Mars or Saturn and the terrible incantation pronounced over it. Where are you, soignatore, usore, dilapidatore, dentore, concessore, divoratore, seductore, seminatore? O ye, makers of hatred and prolongers of enmity, I conjure you by who has created you for this work. I conjure you to complete this work, so that when, the name of person to be bewitched, eats this food, or when, name, etc., places a hand to it in any way, he, or she, shall never rest. Frustrating the Spell Just as processes such as this were widely known to exist in former times and were greatly feared, so did antidotes to witchcraft form a department in their own right. It should not be thought that sorcerers had it all their own way. Only the unprepared could be bewitched. In the early years of the Christian era, the Cornelian stone, set in a ring, was worn as an infallible specific against hostile magic. And this belief was carried westward when the knowledge of the Key of Solomon and similar rituals deserted Byzantium for continental Europe. The magician himself relied to a great extent upon his pentacles, the consecrated figures of a five-pointed star, which were said to be derived from the design on Solomon's mighty ring. When the magical manuscripts now under examination were current in Britain, the search for talismans of defence against magicians went on. For those who were unable to procure a Cornelian, another magical stone was provided in the words of John Durant, a 17th century expert. Of the land toad Take a great toad, kill him, and put him into a horse dung hill. There let him lie, and the ants will consume the flesh. In the head you shall find a thing like a stone, great or little, the which being set in gold, and worn about a man or woman, it doth give them warning of any mischief or ill to them that weareth it, by changing colours in diverse manners. This was one of those general-purpose defensive talismans, which would not only work against witchcraft or any other evil, but would actually warn that the owner was in danger. Another method, when the actual witch or magician was known, was to compel her to remove the spell, if needs be by force. Many cases are reported of witches being forced to take away enchantments or demons by counterspells which caused the witch to suffer awful agonies, until she came and begged forgiveness, and promised never to do the like again. The Times and Powers for Magical Rites Solomon's key concentrates upon planetary data in laying down the days and hours upon which the various kinds of rites are to be performed. It is assumed that most people with an interest in the occult sciences will have a sufficient knowledge of astrology to be able to work out the days and hours of the planets. This is probably so, but the method of working out which days were under which stars, and how the planetary hours were arrived at, 
was conveniently simplified by Albertus Magnus in his Secrets. As this system is simplicity itself, and is given in the section devoted to Albertus Magnus, it will be unnecessary to repeat it here. Before determining the correct day and hour, however, the magician must make up his mind as to what he is to accomplish, and then read off in the list as to which planet governs that type of operation. Solomon summarizes these data as follows. Saturn. Saves from the pit. Operations for good and evil connected with buildings. Gaining familiar spirits to speak in one's sleep. Luck and disaster in business, property, fruits and vegetables. To obtain knowledge, works of hatred, death and disaster. Jupiter. Honour and riches, friendship, physical health, the heart's desire. Mars. War, military success, valour, destruction, works of disharmony, slaughter, death and suffering, to obtain fortune in army affairs. Sun. Money, hope, sortilage, operations to obtain the support of princes and those in power, against hostility and for friendship in general. Venus. Love, friendliness, journeys, kindness and pleasure. Mercury. Eloquence, business, arts and sciences, marvels and conjurations, prediction, discovering thefts, goods and merchandise, operations involving deceit. Moon. Travel, shipping, love and reconciliation, messengers. Theft, new moon, visions, water. Powers of the Hours Hours of Saturn, Mars and Moon, raising spirits, works of hatred and enmity. Hours of Mercury, games, jokes, pastimes, detection of theft with the aid of spirits. Hours of Mars, raising souls from the inferno, particularly soldiers killed in action. Hours of Jupiter and the Sun, works of invisibility, love and well-being, and all unusual experiments. Signs and planets to be considered for magical effects. The effect of the Moon. Constructive efforts to be done when the moon is new. Discord and hatred succeed when the moon is waning. Invisibility and death only when the moon is almost obscured. The zodiacal signs and the moon in magical operations. The moon must be in Taurus, Virgo or Capricornus, that is, earth element signs, for supernatural effects. For operations of love, friendship or invisibility, the moon must be in one of the fire signs, Aries, Leo or Sagittarius. Hatred and discord is to be accomplished when the moon is in a water sign, Cancer, Scorpio or Pisces. All unusual operations are to be planned for dates when the moon is occupying an air sign, Gemini, Libra or Aquarius. In the days when every man had to be his own astrologer and had to work out his own tables, the above data alone would have taken some time to calculate. Magicians of former times would probably have given much for access to aspectarians, such as are published today, and contain the requisite material in tabular form. The law of supply and demand does not seem to hold true in magic, for nowadays there are probably fewer magicians and aspectarians appear in astrological magazines, while the actual astrologers themselves are generally considered respectable and are probably not magicians.